Wait a second. Um, so hi everybody. Um, unfortunately, for whatever reason, we cannot stream currently. So we're just going to hold the talk in the Zoom and we'll record it here and publish it later, just so you all know. Um, sadly, we have no way of figuring out where the problem lies. So that's all we can do for now. Wait just a second while I uh, let everybody in the meeting and then we can start. Okay. Um, okay, great. Everybody's in. Uh, good evening, everybody. Welcome uh, on behalf of the Association for the Design of History. Um, tonight's, tonight's topic uh, or tonight's title is uh, Simulating Socialism, and it will be um, Oh yes, uh, for everybody who just now was let in, we're recording this session. It sadly can't be streamed currently, um, but we record it and we'll publish the recording later. Um, we don't know why, why we can't currently. There's some sort of technical difficulty which we can't fix currently. Um, I hope everybody will have a nice time today uh, regardless, and I hope it will be a, a great, uh, great two talks. Um, so on behalf of the Association for the Design of History, I would like to welcome all of you and I would like to welcome our guest uh, Lee Phillips and uh, Philip Dabrich, our, our member and uh, resident uh, specialist on plant economy. Um, so the Association for the Design of History, if you don't know, is um, a German based but uh, also international now uh, organization that aims to be uh, both a think tank um, a, a, a platform for practical interventions in class struggle and sort of a media outlet uh, in support of these struggles. And uh, we're currently very much uh, looking for members uh, internationally. We do have people in, in several countries now, but regardless of where you live, if you're interested in working with us, uh, you can do so easily if you have an internet connection. And um, yeah, so... Uh, if you're interested, I'll, I'll drop links to our Facebook and to our website and other social media channels um, at some point during this event. So today uh, speaking will be Lee Phillips, who is a Canadian science writer and political journalist, and also the co-author of the book, The People's Republic of Walmart, which I'll hold to the camera, um, which deals with uh, a history of the socialist calculation debate and it's basically a popular history of planned economy and it makes strong arguments for why planned economy is still relevant for the left today and uh, in fact uh, has been uh, more possible today than at any point in the past. And our second speaker today is Philip Dabrich um, who is um, a philosopher and an economist who recently earned his uh, PhD in on the University of Glasgow in the field of philosophy for his work on uh, the simulation of a socialist planned economy. And he will today be speaking about uh, the specifics of his model and the viability for um, a socialist planned economy. So um, if you have any questions during the talk, uh, please uh, refrain from interrupting and um, keep, them, um, keep them up for later. Uh, First, Lee will give a talk and then uh, Philip, and then afterwards we're gonna have like an open uh, question around where you can just put your questions in the chat or if you'd uh, eagerly like to say something uh, yourself uh, and not just uh, have it read out, then you can put it in the chat that you'd like to say something and I will see who gets to speak uh, depending on how much uh, interest we have in that. All right, um, and with that, I'd love to uh, give the, the word to Lee. And uh, I'd like, also like to say we're very grateful to have you here this evening. And uh, we hope it's gonna be a great evening for you as well. Okay, well, it's, uh, I'm, I'm happy to be here, although it's, it's morning where I am. But um, also, also, I should probably just quickly say that um, uh, my, I didn't write it myself. The book was written by my, my co-author, Michal Rosworski. Uh, Canadian uh, economist, and um, so yeah, just wanted to make sure that both our names were were there. Um, uh, to start, I'm, I, 
I, I don't know how many people have read the book, so I don't want to be um, sort of uh, telling things people already know, but also assuming that some people might not have read it. So I'm going to try and uh, take both of those two possible audiences in mind and give a, a very brief overview of, of some of the key ideas, but also why we did it and also to update it uh, in, the, in the current context, particularly with respect to the pandemic with some, some more recent <clears throat> examples. So basically we, Michal and I um, wanted to write the book uh, with the view of everybody in mind, not just speaking to the left specifically. And so one hopes that, and we worked very hard on this in terms of the, the writing of it. Um, one hopes that if one is a, a socialist, but also if one is a social democrat, a liberal, even, even uh, perhaps some sort of um, Rockefeller Republican or One Nation Tory, some sort of conservative that still believes in the power of, of government. And there are more and more of those um, these days uh, since the, uh, the global economic crisis that any one of those sort of figures could read our book and at least take something away from it in terms of an explanation as to why it is perfectly feasible to, um, to engage in economic planning. Um, um, and the, the sort of second reason that we wanted to intervene here uh, with this conversation was actually specifically to the left um, or within the left. And that was because uh, we felt that um, until a couple, until a few years ago, really, uh, uh, there was a sort of sense on the left of there is, you know, a critique of big capitalists, say, or bigness, um, and of, and there was a sort of sense of um, that the reason you might become a capitalist is because you you hated bosses or you hated the bankers, um, and uh, we really wanted to revive the economic question. We wanted to really have a, uh, particularly around the economic calculation debate, which had, you know, many people have left at the time, uh, just had completely forgotten about in a sort of morass of activistism, let's say that, you know, the important thing was to be in the movement and on the street, it's all great, but, um, and, and that sort of criticism of bigness or of just bosses being evil, <clears throat> so really misses the, the core argument of Marxism, um, about the commodity and, mar and hence markets and why it would be the case that it doesn't really matter if um, the owner of a firm is one single boss or uh, a family or a group of shareholders or a union uh, pension fund or even a workers co-op. Um, the, uh, the incentives in a market system uh, towards profit will still drive irrational allocation. So if you have a workers co-op, you are potentially solving one of the major problems with capitalism, which is the domination of the worker, the lack of autonomy, alienation. Um, and it is a great training, uh, workers co-op might be a great training ground for the self-confidence of the working class, but it certainly doesn't deal with the question of irrational allocation. One can think of, for example, in the United States, which, the United States, which largely has a private healthcare system, unlike Canada, Germany, much of Western Europe, um, which have, to a greater or lesser degree, uh, public healthcare systems. If in the United States uh, there was a switch to from private hospitals and private health insurance companies to workers co-op health insurance companies and workers co-op hospitals. The, the fundamental problem that um, is facing the United States with respect to healthcare of irrational allocation that millions of people just don't have access to it would not be solved. And so we really wanted to, um, um, uh, to shift the conversation back to a question of what the problem of markets and the possibility of economic planning. And uh, in, in as simple and popular and fun language as, as we could. It's, a, it's very much a popular introduction to this concept. It's not an academic monograph. Um, and so, for example, um, to put it in a very, in very, very simple language, um, the set of all things that are profitable is much smaller than the set of all things that may be useful to society. And there are some things that we know to be harmful to society, but are remain profitable. 
And so on one side of the uh, sort of economic sort of situation, we have the, the, the challenge of um, the refusal of uh, capitalist entities of firms to produce things that we know to be beneficial because they're not profitable. And on the other side, we have the continued incentive for firms who pro that produce harmful goods or services to continue to produce those. And that was kind of abstract, but let's put some, some meat on the bones there. Yes. So for the, the, la the latter example, uh, for the latter uh, case, the classic example contemporarily would be fossil fuels. We've known as a society roughly since the 70s or 80s uh, <clears throat> that we can't keep combusting fossil fuels without um, a serious existential challenge to, to human society. <clears throat> Nevertheless, the companies that produce those commodities have a continued incentive to, uh, a incentive to continue to produce them, despite this knowledge that we uh, we can't keep produ uh, producing those commodities. They will lobby, they will try to insulate themselves from regulation, so on and so forth. If, um, at, at the same time, we know that there's a set of um, um, technologies that for, you know, roughly about, you know, maybe 80% of the uses that we, we put to, uh, to fossil fuels, put, 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 put fossil fuels to, we could switch tomorrow if we weren't interested in, in profitability both renewables and nuclear power. Um, and on the other side of the, uh, the question, the, this, the, the case of, the, thing, of the, the items that we know to be beneficial but aren't profitable or even insufficiently profitable and so won't be produced, there's another existential threat that humanity faces right now. And that is the rise of antimicrobial resistance. Um, uh, antibiotics are a, were a, a godsend, a fantastic um, uh, development, but unfortunately as a result of both overuse, but also uh, fu uh, fundamentally as a result of just um, ev evolutionary adaptation, over time it is inevitable that, um, that microbes, the bacteria will uh, uh, develop resistance to the current suite of antibiotics. The problem from, uh, from a capitalist point of view is that uh, once you take a course of antibiotics, uh, it takes a few weeks, maybe with a case of tuberculosis, um, maybe a few months, but that's it. And the aim of that commodity is to solve that problem completely. So the patient, um, after uh, the, uh, the infection has been cleared up, doesn't have to purchase that commodity anymore. <clears throat> Much more profitable is a, um, is a drug that um, a patient with a chronic disease has to take potentially every day for the rest of their life. And so it just is simply uh, in the interest of the, uh, the capitalists to uh, investigate those sorts of drugs rather than new classes of uh, um, antibiotic. And what we find in the scientific literature, um, and I'm a, by day I'm a science journalist, that's my, my main thing, by, by night I, I'm a lefty, but you know my main thing is, is just uh, straight science journalism. I cover a lot of, I've covered the issue of antibiotic resistance a great deal. And in the scientific literature, people who are, I have no idea what their politics are, but um, persistently, they, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the conclusion that they draw, both public health officials, clinicians, um, uh, uh, microbiologists, um, the developers uh, in public universities or uh, public labs, uh, the, the, the challenge that we face is simply the matter that um, the large pharmaceutical companies about 40 years ago largely got out of the business of um, researching, developing and producing uh, new classes of antibiotic. As a result of that, uh, within about 25 to 30 years, uh, the foundation of antimicrobial protection that all uh, modern, almost all modern medicine depends Will uh, will be will be largely undermined. So think of any any sort of surgery that you might need, um, even sticking a, a needle in your arm or catheter in your arm. All this depends on a, a background of antimicrobial protection. None of that will be possible, or it's certainly not possible, but it'll be uh, significantly challenged. Um, it, the uh, a lot of public health health officials talk about the potential for a return to a Victorian age of medicine. So in these two cases, climate change and antimicrobial resistance, 
the market just is not made for um, uh, for for the benefit of humanity. <laughs> oh, sorry. And contemporarily with the pandemic, we've seen this more clearly than ever. One would think that with a global pandemic, uh, there would suddenly be an enormous uh, potential for profitability uh, for the production of vaccines. And that, you know, uh, by probably about the midpoint last year, uh, maybe uh, July, August, yeah, it, there was a very strong price signal that, uh, you know, say 7 billion people being inoculated, even if you don't have to, <coughs> oh, sorry, I should say, vaccines suffer from a very similar situation. And that once you take take a, uh, a vaccine, a va once you're vaccinated, you don't have to be vaccinated again, other than maybe a booster shot for some for some um, um, uh, uh, infectious diseases. <clears throat> Which means that it's insufficiently profitable. And once again, public health officials, virologists, clinicians in the scientific literature make the argument that over the last 30, 40 years, large pharmaceutical companies have largely got out of the business of developing vaccines. And there has been a lot of work over the last five to 10 years within um, um, the NGO space to try to figure out ways to incentivize new production of vaccines. And then of course the, pan uh, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic happened. So you would think that there would be suddenly with you know, 7 billion people, there would be a, a significant incentive to produce vaccines. <clears throat> and there was, that's true, that, um, that that pandemic did to some extent um, de-risk the innovation. However, <clears throat> we didn't know that for the first few months. Um, and we have confronted uh, pandemics in the past that have not uh, stretched around the world before, but they've certainly crossed borders. Uh, we can think of uh, SARS-1, uh, MERS, um, some of the, uh, the, the swine flu um, outbreaks, um, uh, bird flu outbreaks over the, the 2000s. And in each of these cases, the, uh, there was a sort of wait and see mo uh, period by the large pharmaceutical companies because there's basically no point in investing the many billions of dollars in uh, research and development clinic and crucially clinical trials which are extraordinarily expensive and then manufacturing which is also quite expensive if um suddenly the uh, that outbreak uh dries up that uh, you also simply you won't have enough um um, uh, patients, per perhaps some of those patients will be in the developing world. So again, it's not a great um, uh, uh, you know, chance of profitability there. Thankfully, very early on, as early as February, in the United States, the um, Biomedical Advanced Research and Development Agency um, uh, uh, started incentivizing uh, the production of vaccines almost straight away. And uh, this is a government agency, um, so sort of spun out of the Pentagon, uh, based on the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, um, with the understanding that uh, there is a, a lack of um, profitability for this sort of basic research or even development, and so the state needs to step in and, and do this. Um, it's, some, it's kind of interesting that it's not sort of leftists that have done this, but it was initially the Pentagon that um, recognized that this was, uh, this was, a, this was an issue. And this, um, by the midpoint of the year, uh, Donald Trump turned this into what everybody now knows as Operation Warp Speed, or to put it another way, they took what BARDA, the Biomedical Advanced Research, uh, uh, Research and Development Agency, and rebranded it as uh, what they were already doing and rebranded it as Operation Warp Speed, juiced it up a little bit. And um, thanks almost entirely to, to that, uh, we have uh, we met the, the 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 state managed to de-risk the um, uh, this innovation this development. It's um, it's a bit of a, uh, a challenging thing for me as a lefty to say, but I ha have to be honest that yeah, that was a great move on the part of Donald Trump. Um, um, basically. Um, what the, the challenge that we, we discuss in the book 
along these lines, and these were these are just contemporary examples, but um, within the economic calculation debate, the uh, which is potentially the, the conservatives, the conservative economic argument within the uh, economic calculation debate is, I have to be honest and say this is probably the greatest challenge, uh, the strongest intellectual challenge to socialism that was ever mounted. Um, the reality is that um, planning of complex systems of um, a myriad, potentially millions of variables in a supply chain is a very hard thing to do. And that is what's needed to be done if we're not going to be using the market as the, the, and the price signal as the primary mechanism of allocation in our economy. Um, when Mayhaw and I were touring our book, a number of people from, from some members of audiences when we were doing um, talks about the book would say, look, this book has shown that it's very, very simple, very easy uh, for us to have socialism. Um, all we have to do, it's just the political will. Um, we just need to overthrow the bosses and it, there you go. And this was actually the opposite of what we we're trying to say in the book. We're saying, no, it, it's right, it's correct. It is really, really, really hard um, to engage in this sort of planning. Um, the problem that we disagree, or that the point that we disagree with, with respect to the, the conservatives within the economic calculation debate, is that they conclude that because it's difficult, therefore it's impossible. It's, it's simply not impossible. And what we wanted to do is we <clears throat> wanted to update the conversation around um, the calculation debate with this sort of throwaway line from uh, the, uh, the, uh, the Marxist and uh, literary theorist, um, Frederick Jameson, who in one essay makes a sort of throwaway line saying that the left contemporarily is insufficiently or not properly utopian. If we want to be properly utopian, we should look to Walmart of all places, the largest corporation in the world. It is engaged in um, uh, economic planning internally on the vastest of scales. And um, anyway, that was all he, he mentioned in that, in that article. What Mihao and I wanted to do was we, we wanted to take that line and investigate it and say, oh, well, that's, you know, that's, that's true. Let's, let's put some meat on the bones there and let's investigate exactly how it is that they're able to, um, to plan. And um, so that forms a good chunk of the book. We also look at uh, examples like Amazon, and the technologies they use to uh, to predict what people will want um, that um, don't necessarily completely sit within uh, sort of price signals. Um, we look at the the National Health Service in the UK, which is probably the uh, most, or until relatively recently, the most socialist example or uh, most planified example of a public healthcare system, where the entirety of the um, uh, the system is owned by the state. In Canada, where I live, we have public health care, but the, a lot of the hospitals and clinics still remain in private or charitable hands, and the state just pays for it. Whereas in the UK, the NHS is actually, you know, owns all the chunks of the system, or until recently it did. Um, and we also wanted to look at some other examples um, um, in history and in the contemporary economy, but I won't go into all of those. <clears throat> and the argument that we make is that um, if it, if, the conservative argument within the economic cal calculation debate is accurate, um, then how can Walmart plan? It has, there are far more, there are many millions more variables um, that it needs to take account of than the Soviet Union at its height. Um, there are uh, potentially hundreds of millions of, of categories of product that they sell. And they don't merely sell them, there are many of these that they actually produce in house as well, their own branded. Um, um, products that uh, reach quite deep into the, the supply chain, not quite as far as the production of raw, raw materials, but, but very, um, very far, uh, very deep into the supply chain. Um, if, if it were true that you couldn't, uh, and uh, if, if it were true that you couldn't plan so, uh, something on a vast scale as the Soviet Union, why does Walmart work? It's, it's clearly much vaster. Now, sure, in terms of revenues, it's not as large. It's not as large as um, uh, the Soviet Union in the 1980s, but uh, the, the GDP of the, uh, the Soviet Union in the 1980s. But it is so roughly on the scale 
uh, slightly smaller than the Soviet Union. So prior to the oil crisis and then expansion of um, oil development in, in the Soviet Union in the early 1970s. So it's, it's of that scale. Um, and what I did was, what Michal and I did uh, was, we looked into the, so the business literature, the, the, the operations research, the management uh, scholarship. Uh, these are not necessarily people who are socialists by any stretch. These are people who are um, commerce scholars. And their argument is effectively that uh, the success of Walmart and similar companies of that scale is a sort of planification of the supply chain. So rather than engaging in, well, it's twofold, it's planification of the, of the supply chain. And of course, crucially, there's been significant technological advance since the 1960s and 1970s. That is a, um, IT events that has allowed uh, sharing of information along the, the, this, the supply chain. So instead of um, truly being a, a market-based exchange between uh, Walmart and many of its suppliers, a lot of them in many respects allow the planified system to make the decisions for them on the, uh, with respect to production. And vice versa, that if there's any sort of hiccups along the uh, supply chain, that information is transmitted to Walmart or in other people along the su supply chain within seconds, uh, less than seconds. When somebody purchases uh, a product at a till in Walmart, that information is transmitted right through the supply chain instantaneously. So it, uh, this, um, this radical sharing of information, this trust, this cooperation um, does have so great socialist resonances, um, even if on the ex uh, outside of Walmart, obviously Walmart exists within a sea of prices. But then, you know, the Soviet Union existed within a sea of prices as well. It wasn't an autarky. Um, it sold <clears throat> and bought goods on the international market. So that's an insufficient uh, rationale to say that, well, this is just um, a firm um, and this doesn't have any sort of argument. Uh, it, it doesn't have any uh, logical consequence for the feasibility of economic planning on a, uh, on a sort of uh, national scale or uh, even global scale. I think I've run over my time um, a little bit there, so I'll stop it. Um, uh, towards the end of the book, we do talk a little bit more about the, the technological transformation. <clears throat> what I should, uh, that has happened in the last 40 years that have allowed some of this to happen. What One quick last thing that I do want to say, though, is that some people have taken, some critics, some left-wing critics of our book um, have taken our argument as to say, there doesn't need to be any class struggle, there doesn't need to be any political change. Um, all that has to happen is you know, a new tech, you know, new technology allows us to have socialism. Let's all go home and wait for uh, technology to uh, to save us. This is not the argument at all. Um, we simply note that I mean, th it's a classical Marxist argument that as the forces of production, including technology, develop, um, the relations of the product, the relations of production, can be uh, at a mismatch with the as those. To, uh, as, that te as those forces of production, including technology, advance. Is it not possible that um, over the course of the, the latter half of the 20th century and into the 21st century, that there have been some significant technological advances that make socialism more feasible? Um, that doesn't mean automatically that these, uh, these technological changes will um, be uh, put at the service of socialism. We already see, um, <clears throat> for example, um, uh, Google, Google's uh, airline ticket recommendation engines, which is a really impressive piece of, 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 of programming. <clears throat> it, um, because human beings basically have a great, enormous difficulty <clears throat> um, assessing more than two or three factors in any decision, um, it's, it's often very hard for us to uh, to uh, to figure out which uh, which airline we should fly with, what time we should fly with, how many stopovers there should be, um, and uh, which seat we're going to sit in. Do we want an aisle seat? Do we want a window seat? Are we okay if the price is really low and sitting in the middle of the the um, the row? 
um, thinking about what kind of food the airline offers, all these different things. We try to juggle them in our, our mind, but actually really, it's really hard for us to do this. However, <clears throat> algorithmically, uh, this is increasingly feasible where um, Google sort of knows you over the course of your time online that you have certain preferences uh, along these and even wait, actually knows how you, you would weight them if you didn't have to consciously think about this. So that, that set of sort of recommendations um, allows, uh, is able to map uh, the ticket to you better than the price signal itself. And corporations are using uh, this information, including Amazon, um, in addition to the price signal. I wouldn't say the price signal has gone away, but it is really remarkable how um, there are many other different factors that are um, uh, taken into account now um, within transactions uh, wherein the price signal is price signal is playing a smaller and smaller role. Um, that's certainly now just because that's happening doesn't mean that suddenly um, socialism has arrived. No, it, the uh, this is to the benefit of the shareholders of Google. This is to the benefit of the shareholders of the airline companies. This hasn't delivered any uh, significant benefit to the workers in those companies or to I mean there's some benefit to society in the sense that we probably get a better um, uh, ticket than we otherwise would uh, if we tried to make those calculations ourselves, but that's that's certainly not socialism. Anyway, so the point being very simply that just because technological advance happens doesn't necessarily making socialism more feasible doesn't make it uh, make socialism automatically appear. We it still requires political struggle, class struggle to capture that technology and make it wait for wait work for us instead of working for the bosses. All right. Thank you very much, Lee. So next will be Philip Tabrich. Um, I'd like to remind everybody that you can post questions in the chat in let's say about 40 minutes. Uh, you can start posting stuff in the chat and then we'll be able to work through them um, at the end of the talk by Philip. And with that, I'd like to uh, also uh, re remember that, that uh, what we are doing here is being recorded and we intend to publish this later. So uh, if you want to speak, you can speak questions exactly, um, but if you want to, you're gonna have to be uh, sure that um, this is going to be uh, it's going to be published later. And um, if you wouldn't like to do that, please let us know that you don't want to be in the recording. Thank you. And with that, I'd like to give the word to Philip. Thank you very much. So, I'll just open up my PowerPoint presentation. There we go. Okay, so as uh, Sebastian said at the beginning, I recently um, finished my uh, PhD on uh, socialist plant economies. And uh, this was really an interdisciplinary project. So I looked at it both from the side of philosophy and some philosophical arguments that people have presented against socialism, as well as some of the sort of more economic issues that uh, Lee also talked about. And that's also what I'm going to be focusing on today. Um, and in the end, I uh, was able to come up with um, a sort of new model of socialism, which is an adaption of an earlier model by uh, my PhD supervisor. And I also implemented this in a computer simulation. And it's sort of this model and the simulation of it that I will be presenting today. So first of all, uh, something about the background of this. Um, we have, of course, this idea of economic planning, uh, which I trace back to really the work of uh, Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels who promoted this idea of planning, sort of collectively planning the entire economy, not just the activities within a single firm, right, but also on, on a societal scale, the interactions between different enterprises and so on, that would be collectively planned. Uh, the problem is that Marx and Engels were really not very specific about how this would work. Engels, I think, at some point said it'd be very simple, <laughs> but he doesn't really tell us uh, uh, why he thinks that something as complex as that would, would indeed be simple and how it should be done. Uh, 
Um, you then have in sort of the Eastern socialist countries, this method of material balancing. And the idea with material balancing is you want an economic plan that is uh, logically consistent. So for example, uh, if the plan says uh, that the car industry should use more, more steel than is being produced by the steel industry, obviously that's not going to work, right? So you need um, a plan that is consistent between the outputs of steels and the inputs of steel and other industries and so on. And that worked reasonably well. So planners were able to come up with plans that were internally consistent and they were feasible in this sense. But what this guy you see on the right, Leonid Kantorovich, uh, a Soviet mathematician and economist, um, argued is that you could have multiple feasible plans, right, which are balanced in this regard, but some of them could just be better than others in the sense that they might be able to produce more stuff with the same resources. Um, and this material balancing method simply doesn't ensure you that you have such an optimal plan. It only ensures that you have a feasible plan, but there might be better, more optimized plans. And uh, he was also then able to show that these kinds of problems uh, sort of have certain things in common. They can be formulated as linear optimization problems. But the problem was with sort of classical mathematical tools at the time, these problems were simply not solvable. But Kantorowicz then was able to show that uh, or develop an algorithmic method uh, with which sort of step by step you can approximate uh, and in the end have an optimal solution to these kinds of problems. And uh, I think he was the only Soviet economist uh, or maybe even the only socialist economist um, that was uh, actually awarded the Nobel Prize in economics precisely for this work. So you then also have sort of another chain of thought uh, that, that feeds into my work, um, which is sort of socialist considerations of distribution and valuation of consumer goods. Um, with Marx and Engels, uh, Marx in particular, you have this idea of people being given out labor vouchers. And you're basically paid vouchers depending on the amount of labor time that you've sort of uh, contributed to socialized production. And these vouchers then entitle you to take out an equivalent amount of products measured by the labor time that is uh, necessary to produce these items, right? Uh, but then sort of around 1930s, you start having this idea um, of market socialism, because people realize that, you know, in some sense, or in some ways, markets uh, actually do something incredible and uh, can be very efficient in certain, certain ways. And the first instance of this uh, that I'm aware of is by Dickinson, who argued that instead of having these like fixed prices, um, which are fixed to the labor time necessary to produce something, you should adapt the prices a bit like, like a market might do until you get market clearing rates. And these are basically the prices at which supply and demand would be balanced. Um, I'll talk more about uh, that later. And then you have a complete model presented by my PhD supervisor, Paul Cockshot and his co-author, Alan Cottrell in their book, Towards New Socialism. And what they suggest is that a plan target that um, so an optimized production plan should be adapted to consumer behavior as signaled by these market clearing prices and what they do is they use labor values as cost indicators so this is something they take over sort of from marx that um, the costs of various products are measured by the labor time necessary to produce them but what I then argue is that these labor values ignore other factors, especially greenhouse gas emissions, uh, which I think is very relevant because of climate change. Uh, and I thus um, change basically their model by simply adopting a different measure of, uh, of cost, a different measure of value based on opportunity cost. And I'll uh, explain how I do that, how I calculate these values uh, in a second. So I'll now uh, sort of go through 
my model and the simulation of it step by step, this is of course in many ways still simplified and um, uh, and uh, could be you know worked on further to take into consideration other factors and maybe make it a bit a uh, bit more sophisticated and reliable. Um, but I'll talk you briefly through sort of the whole picture before then going into a bit more detail on every step of the way. So we start off at the top here with the plan target. And uh, this sort of gives you a general idea of, of what, what's supposed to be achieved by the plan. And based on that plan target and uh, available means and resources, you then calculate an optimized production plan in, this, in the next step. Based on that optimized production plan, you then know how many consumer goods are going to be made available to consumers, right? What do we have available that can be consumed by people? And then in the next step, you determine the market clearing prices, which, uh, which simply occur when these, uh, these consumer goods are then marketed to consumers. You then compare these prices to values. And based on that comparison, you adapt the plan target. And one of these circles in my simulation uh, takes around uh, 30 days. So the idea is one, one circle takes 30 days and then you have a new plan target. And for the next plan period of 30 days, you then calculate a new plan, which is adapted to the consumer needs, right? So, and this, this way the, the planning is constantly adapted to, uh, to consumer demand. So let's go into a bit more detail on each of these steps. So we start with the plan target. And what this is, it's simply a table like this, which has an entry for each kind of product. And uh, it specifies the proportions at which these various products should be produced. So for example, here for, each, for six units of corns, you're gonna be producing seven units of coal and 10 units of bread. So this just gives you the proportions at which consumer products should be produced. But it only considers the part of the product which is really intended for end consumers, right? Which people might at the end of the day buy uh, at Walmart or wherever. And uh, this means that for products which are only used in industry, which won't be used by end consumers at home, uh, the entry will be zero. So in this sort of simplified example for iron, you have an entry of zero because that will only be used by, uh, by industry. Okay, so this gives an idea of what a plant target is, simply proportions at which various products are, um, are meant to be produced. And based on that, we then produce an optimized plant target, uh, an optimized uh, production plan, sorry. But of course, we have to take into account sort of physical constraints on production. There's certain limits of resources uh, and we can't use more than these resources. And uh, these constraints are then supposed to ensure that we use no more materials than are available or that are being produced according to that plan. And you have the, an input table, which you see on the right here, uh, which tells you what the various production methods that are available are, right? So here you have farming and it tells you then what inputs are required for this production method. So for farming, you might need some corn for sowing. You might need some energy. Uh, you might need some metal uh, tools or machinery and of course labor. This is again, of course, a very simplified, um, simplified economy in, uh, the model also allows for you know, much more complex uh, uh, economies, which more different types of products and different types of method, but then the table, which simply not fit on, on your screen right now. So this is just a simplified model. And you can also have various methods which would produce the same thing, right? So in this case, you only have one kind of farming method, but you might have various kinds of farming methods. You then also have further tables, which I haven't shown on here. These would tell you what's being produced with these production methods, what the available resource limits are, how much fertile land is available for farming, for example, right? And then based on these tables, you can uh, formulate these constraints on production as 
uh, linear inequalities. Uh, that's these are the inequalities that that are shown here at the beginning. You don't have to understand them, but the basic idea is that you can't use more of a product than is available, and these inequalities ensure that. And then you also have further inequalities or constraints which ensure that production is at the proportion specified by the plant target, which I've shown you earlier, right? So that for every six units of corn, you have seven units of coal and so on. So these are the constraints. And then you want to find an optimized production plan. And what optimization means is basically you have some mathematical function called the objective function. And you want to find uh, sort of the maximum value of that function, how you reach the maximum value of that function. And in my model, the objective function is simply given by the output of an arbitrary consumer product, right? You, so you choose one product, let's say corn, which is what I've used. And then you um, find out how you can produce as much of that product as possible without violating any of the constraints that we talked about in the last slide. So the optimized plan is then simply the plan that maximizes the objective function without violating any of these constraints. And it also, of course, keeps the proportion specified by the plan target. So for every six units of corn, seven units of coal and so on and so on. Uh, and this is a linear optimization problem that can be solved. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, Kantorowicz was really the first person to show that it can be solved and how it can be solved. I use um, a free software application called LP Solve. Uh, this is not based on Kantorowicz's method. This is based on an alternative method that was later independently discovered uh, in the West and is more commonly used today, but it basically also solved these kinds of optimization problems. Okay, so this then gives us an optimized production plan. This basically tells us what production methods should we be using to produce as much as possible. And it also tells us then how many consumer products we're going to have at the end that can be made available to consumers. And that's the supply in the next step, right? So we need to know what the supply of consumer products is going to be. And then these consumer products get marketed to consumers and uh, at, at a certain price, which then has to be adapted. So of course, in my simulation, I don't have real consumers, right? In the real world, this would be actual people going to supermarkets, choosing uh, consumer goods from the shelves at a certain, uh, at a certain price, right? Uh, but in my simulation, I simply simulated this. I used sort of a simple agent-based model to uh, simulate real consumers. And uh, it works well enough for the purposes of the simulation. And what then happens is um, you start off with some initial price. Uh, this price should already be reasonable if at all possible. What I imagine is that if we were to transition from capitalism to socialism, we might simply start off with the prices that you already had under capitalism for consumer products. And then you see, well, how many people are buying yogurts, puddings, apples, bread, and so on, right? And you see what the demand for these consumer products is. And then you compare that to the supply that is made available by production and uh, then adjust the prices accordingly. So if demand is higher than supply, then you need to increase the price. But if demand is lower than supplies, then you um, lower the supply so that nothing gets left over at the end, right? And I imagine that this is being done sort of one, once a day, and then you do this 30 times, which is the plan period. And at the end of those 30 days, you then have approximated the market clearing price. So the price at which supply and demand are balanced. And uh, what I was able to observe, at least in my, uh, my simulations, was that uh, you had a pretty good approximation after 30 days. Um, this might become more difficult as you have uh, more different kinds of products and so on. Um, but that seems to work reasonably well. 
So you now have the market clearing prices. You already sort of marketed some products to consumers. Uh, but we now want for future production, we want to adapt that to the needs of consumers. And in order to do that, we first compare the prices to values. So if the prices for an item are high, that means there's a lot of demand for that item and maybe we should be producing more of that particular item. While if the prices uh, for an item are low, right? No one's buying apples, no one wants apples, even though the price is very low, that people are still not buying it. Then maybe we shouldn't be producing as many apples, okay? So the question now is high or low relative to what? We need some comparison here. And uh, this might be different for different kinds of items. So $500 is a reasonable price maybe for a laptop, but uh, for an Apple, this would be ridiculously expensive, right? So, but what is a reasonable cost indicator for consumer items? And what I'm suggesting is that the best cost indicator is basically opportunity cost. So we ask what are the opportunity costs for one unit of a product? And what this means is what other possibilities are we losing out on by using resources to produce this product? We can't use these resources to do other things. And that's basically what we're losing out on. Another way to ask these questions is, if we were able to produce one unit of a product for free, right? This magically just appears for free without having to use any resources, any labor for this. How could the use resources we no longer need for this product then be used instead? That's the basic idea. And this is quite literally what, what I do. You remember the input table I showed you at the beginning. And now you have an additional method called the free bread method. And this magically creates one unit of bread without requiring any resources. It doesn't require corn, doesn't require coal or iron or bread or labor, nothing like that. You just uh, get one unit of bread for free, okay? And when you do that, what you observe is that the objective function, so basically a measure for how much stuff we're producing, increases from, uh, in one example, I calculated 1,161 0.26, it increases ever so slightly to 1,161.45 when the free bread method is used. Because the resources which are no longer needed to produce that one unit of bread can now be used to produce other things. Okay. And the value of one unit of bread is thus the slight increase of 0 0.19 that gives us the value of bread. While the values for corn and coal in this example were 0 0.31 and 0 0.32. Right? So these, uh, this gives you an idea of how these values would be calculated. In the original model by Paul Corkshot and Alan Cottrell, instead of these values, they simply use labor values, as I said. Right? So they look at how much labor is overall necessary to produce this product. And I tried both and, and compared it, and I'll show you the comparison later. But in my model, what you then do is you compare the prices to these values and you use that to adapt the plan target. So uh, first we have to make the values, we have to scale them to make them directly comparable to prices. Never mind how exactly you do that. Just trust me that it's possible. Um, and if the pr prices of a product is then below its value, then you in, uh, then you reduce the corresponding plant target. So in the example of coal, he, we see here, right? So coal got reduced by 1% because the price of coal was below its value. So we shouldn't be producing as much coal because there's not enough demand for it. But if the price is above the value, the plant target is increased by 1%. And this is what we see for corn and for bread here, right? There seems to be high demand for corn and for bread. So we increase the plan target to put a stronger emphasis on the production of that in the future. And then you have a new plan target. And then in the next plan period, you calculate an optimized production plan based on the new plan target and the whole circle begins again. So uh, some results 
from this. Uh, here's the first case that I considered. Um, what you see here is the, um, this is a simple example, even, even more simple, where you just have two consumer products, A and B. And uh, basically, product A requires significant uh, greenhouse gas emissions, while product B is sort of the more environmentally friendly product. Okay. And what this, uh, these arrows show you is basically how much of each product is being produced. So you have to look at the tip of the arrow. And if you look at the black arrow, it's around 2,500 of product A that's being produced and uh, around 2,500 of product B that's being produced. And uh, this is what, what you get when you don't constrain emissions. So you basically say, however much greenhouse gas emissions are necessary to produce as much as possible, that can be done, okay? And, and then you get the black arrow. But when you then introduce an emission constraint, so you say, we don't want to emit more greenhouse gases than a certain amount, you cap it. In the labor value model, what you get is you simply uh, produce less overall in this example. So that's the, shown by the red arrow. You still produce at the same proportions, just less, around 2,000 of each. Okay. But in my model, what instead happens is that the plan target shifts so that you produce relatively, produce relatively more of product B, which is the environmentally friendly product, but much less of product A, which is the more uh, harm, environmentally harmful product that produces more emissions. And I think that's precisely what should happen. We shouldn't simply sort of reduce what's being produced overall. We also should take into account, you know, which products are actually uh, causing these emissions and maybe scale back on these, um, but uh, then put a stronger emphasis maybe on alternative products, which, um, which involve less emissions. And then another example, so this, this example differed in that there were uh, different alternative production methods available. And actually what you see happening is that uh, in the labor value model, production actually shifts towards the um, more environmentally destructive product A, right? So this is kind of the opposite of what I think should happen, while my model still shifts towards the more environmentally friendly product. Okay, some discussion points about this. So what's the point of all of this? What does this show? I think the simulation and my model shows that you can use this kind of optimized production planning and you can couple it with consumer feedback. So the behavior of consumers would be taken into account in production planning and production would constantly be adjusted based on what consumers actually, uh, actually need and want. Um, both versions of the model, the one based on labor values and the one based on, on my opportunity cost valuations, they both allow you to constrain emissions, right? So you can both just say, introduce a constraint and say, we're not going to emit more than a certain amount of CO2. That's possible in both versions, but the results uh, in the plant target differ. Um, so in my model, it consistently emphasizes low emission products over higher emission products. While as we saw in the labor value model, that's uh, not the case. And sometimes you actually get the opposite. Um, but here's some, some problems and possible solutions to this. So the, uh, the computational complexity of uh, my valuation mechanism is, is an issue because you basically need one optimization to calculate each value for each product. Uh, and that can be a problem. Uh, however, uh, Paul Cockshot developed uh, an algorithm which he calls Harmony, the Harmony algorithm. And this is much more efficient than conventional linear optimizations. So this uh, does help significantly if you use this uh, algorithm and step. Uh, and I think also there might be simpler ways of determining similar values, uh, which uh, I want to look at in the future. There are also some limitations of the consumer model that I used. Uh, which has limited realism, but this is of course only a problem in the simulation uh, and not a problem if you were to apply this in the real world because then you'd have actual people, actual consumers. Another limitation is that currently my model doesn't really allow for economic 
growth, or at least the simulation doesn't allow for this. Um, but there are methods of planning with uh, the expansion of production as well. These methods already exist. What you'd have to do is then actually um, link these to consumer feedback the way that I've done this. And this, this as far as I know, hasn't been done yet. So um, that'd be a subject of future work as well. And then uh, I think there's still a lot that can be done to up to, to um, improve these um, consumer feedback mechanisms, right? The way that uh, prices are adapted to uh, consumer behavior and the way that then the plan target is adapted in response to prices. These are what, what one might call uh, feedback control mechanisms. And I used really simple control mechanisms here, but I think someone who knows more about control engineering than I do would be uh, able to improve on that significantly. For example, by using more complex controllers, fine tuning some parameters, uh, or also something I considered is using machine learning algorithms here. The problem I had is that uh, in, in my simulation, there was simply not enough training data uh, available that would allow these, uh, these machine learning algorithms to learn you know, how to even perhaps predict consumer behavior and so on. Okay, that's it from me. Thank you very much. And I look forward to the questions and discussion. Yeah, thank you very much, Philip. Um, um, Lee, if you were to have some sort of uh, question or a discussion you would like to have with Philip, uh, you get the first uh, shot at this, of course. Okay, I'll, I have one question. Um, so this is really intriguing about how uh, using opportunity cost <clears throat> uh, as a way to discover the valuation um, rather than uh, labor time. I think that's really, that's very tantalizing. Um, and in particular, you showed how <clears throat> it reduced your toy model here of, um, of CO2. My question is, however, in the real world, uh, it is not merely the case that we want to uh, produce less CO2, but we want to produce zero CO2. How is that incorporated into your model outside of simply just legislation saying that we won't pr uh, produce um, commodity, uh, not commodities, um, goods or services that um, emit CO2? Yeah, so I, I think that's a very good question. Um, my model is very much sort of focused on, on short-term planning, right? And um, I think that is important even when it comes to reducing climate change that you might sort of in the short term try to limit emissions. And that's basically what I'm trying to do. But of course you also need this sort of long-term planning. And that's also what I alluded to at, uh, at, at the end, also with like sort of economic growth and all these things, which basically in the long term change the composition of the economy. That's something that I haven't really looked at in detail yet, right? But there are, sort of ways of, of doing that in the literature already. Um, uh, but uh, when it comes to climate change, of course, you need that as well, right? You, do, you can't just sort of say, okay, tomorrow we're going to emit less CO2. You also need sort of a strategy for, uh, you know, building over years, building up uh, alternative energy sources and so on. And, you know, railways, which take years to plan and build uh, and, and don't just sort of magically appear overnight, right? So that's, uh, that's something some, something else that, that, that you do need to look at. What, what my model is sort of looking at uh, is, is basically an alternative to the market price mechanism, uh, which you also mentioned, right? Which, uh, which I think is important, but uh, the strength of the market price mechanism has always been, in my, my opinion, that it allows sort of this sort of short-term adaption to, um, yeah. to, to, to sort of consumer demand. With this long-term planning, I think the market price mechanism has always been rubbish anyway. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, so, so, I, so, so I wanted to, to look at, I think uh, the, the circumstances under which you could make a case that the market price mechanism still has an advantage and show that no, actually we can you know, solve even that problem. Great, sir. thanks. All right, um, so one second. Mira asked in the chat, with the analogy to Walmart and capitalist company supply structures, what is the controlling system for economic efficiency in the planned economy? 
What I'm thinking about, what are measures against this planned economy going bankrupt by lacking economic efficiency because of human errors, lack of economic interest, etc.? Suppose either of you could answer if you if you'd like. Lee, do you want to? Sure. Answer? Yeah. So um, I think what you're sort of hinting at there is sort of uh, soft budget constraints. The question of um, when a an enterprise is beginning to fail in a planned economy, um, the the funds allocated to that uh, enterprise just can uh, just balloon um, because you want the enterprise to keep going. Um, the argument I would say uh, about that, I mean, I think it's a very sound critique, uh, but the, the problem is that that exists within capitalist societies as well. The uh, too big to fail um, uh, financial institutions during the global financial crisis are just one classic example of that. Um, or the bailouts of the airline industry during uh, the pandemic or the bailouts of um, um, the auto industry over and over and over again. Um, I think these are political questions rather than um, challenges that um, are unique to um, uh, a socialist planned economy. They exist within capitalism as well. Philip, would you like to add something? No, that's pretty much the answer I would have given as well. Great. Um, so Ethan would like to voice this question himself. So you can go ahead if you'd like. Hi. Um, is that good? Yeah. Um, yeah, so I just I wrote it out. Um, I just wanted to say thanks first. I think um, everyone who's like been involved in the speakers are doing really, really important work exploring like cybernetics. Um, what I wanted to know was, do you know what the status of cybernetics is? And like cybernetic planning is in socialist states like Cuba and Vietnam or states like Venezuela that are moving towards socialism and where do you see cybernetic planning fitting into this anticipated sort of third wave of revolutions and like a new socialist block um, could you basically just talk about the potential of cybernetics to build like a 21st century socialism that can plan a response to the climate crisis, escape economic warfare, and like undermine the sort of power base of cap capitalist states or a capitalist block. Thanks. I don't really know uh, too much about, you know, the extent to which this is being done in, in contemporary socialist countries. I think uh, maybe Lee, you, you know more about this, but as far as I'm aware, where they still use economic planning, it's still very much sort of the, the Soviet methods, right, which have been used for, for decades. That's my understanding, at least. Do you know anything more about this? Um, so I, I, I'm not, again, I'm not an expert on Vietnam or, or Cuba. Uh, what I would say is, I mean, I'm a democratic, I would straight up say I'm a democratic socialist. I have much more uh, criticism of um, uh, the Soviet Union and um, the People's Republic of China, and even Cuba, I would say, um, I, I be, we want free trade unions, freedom of uh, freedom of speech, freedom of the press, uh, freedom of freedom to organize, and we don't see that uh, properly experienced in those countries. Um, and I, this, why this relates to the question of cybernetics, is that I think one of the most interesting examples, the primitive examples of cybernetic planning, was of course the was Cybersyn in, in Salvador and Chile, who was also a democratic socialist. In fact, the very first democratically elected Marxist um, uh, leader in in the world, and he was very very sensitive to the challenges, the democratic challenges of the supposed um, really existing uh, socialist societies. And the, uh, the Cybersyn <clears throat> system was precisely conceived in order to have this bottom-up um, um, flow of information from the shop floor, from communities, up towards um, the sort of the bureaucrats engaged in, in planning, and then feeding that bureaucratic informa uh, information from the bureaucrats back down to um, the shop floor, to factories, to communities. Um, and I, I'm afraid that I don't see, um, I, I see within, within China, and we could, I mean, gosh, we have like a whole day conference on, on, on the nature of planning within, uh, within China. 
I think China is a very fascinating case in the sense that it is clearly not a purely um, market economy. Uh, it is clearly a very strongly economically planned economy with significant market aspects. Um, but in those uh, sectors that are planned, uh, it isn't. It doesn't embrace in any way um, what Salvador Allende was 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 wanting, where there is a genuine sort of democratic fee, fee, feedback system. Um, and if we are, as we move forward, I, I mean, this goes back to what I was saying in my initial conversation, which is planning can happen. The planning is absolutely feasible. The question is, uh, who is doing the planning? Is it we working people, ordinary citizens in society, or is it uh, uh, being performed by, uh, by capitalists, in the case of the shareholders of, of Walmart, or in the case of the, the Stalinist um, um, bureaucrats in, in in the People's Republic of China, and I think we need to stay alive to that. But I imagine people who may be more sympathetic to, and I, I know that Paul Cockshaw himself is more sympathetic uh, to um, uh, to the uh, these the Stalinist countries than I am. But uh, um, yeah, I think democracy and freedom need to be at the, the beating heart of, of what we're we're about. I don't think we aren't socialists if. if if we don't put at, that at the heart of what we're, we're, we're doing. So uh, Ishan, and I hope I pronounced your name correctly, asked in the chat, uh, my biggest question would be, and has been since I first came across Cockshot's work, how would a national economy decouple from globalized finance to move on to labor voucher type plan planned economy? Wouldn't it be virtually embargoed from the entire world because nobody would accept labor vouchers as a method of payment? Payment. I personally feel like the only way for this to happen is that it has to start with the Leviathans, the US and the Eurozone giants, kind of like the abrogation Bretton Woods, which is slightly different, but you get the point. So I suppose either of you may answer. If you're interested. Yeah, I, I'm going to take that one uh, at first, at least. It's very interesting um, uh, question. So. What you have to keep in mind about um, the way that like labor vouchers, or I call them credits because in, in my system, they're not really that tied to labor time anymore. At least the prices aren't. Um, they, they're really meant just for distributing consumer goods to sort of consumers within the, the socialist economy, right? Um, when it comes to international trade, um, I, I would suggest that you simply use uh, a foreign currency for that, right? So let's, you know, take sort of the classic Cold War example. Let's say we have like the capitalist US and like a new democratic Soviet Union or something like this, right? Uh, the Soviet Union could trade with the United States using US dollars. And uh, this could even be factored into um, optimized, pr um, optimized planning. The way you do this is, trade would basically be a production method that uses uh, US dollars to obtain like some, some good produced in the US or that uses up some good produced in the democratic Soviet Union um, to obtain US dollars, which can then be used to obtain some other good, right? So that can be integrated and, and I would suggest this just using foreign currency for that. Um, and, and then the, the labor vouchers or credits would simply be used within the country. Um, there's, of course, still the, the possibility, and I think that that can always happen, that there's uh, like a trade blockade and that, you know, other countries simply refuse to trade. Um, I think that that can always happen. I don't think it's something that should stop us from doing this because, uh, I mean, if we're in this situation where other countries sort of just, you know, um, use their political power or their trade influence to try to prevent us from uh, doing what we think is best uh, in the economy, then uh, I don't think we're ever going to get anywhere. Uh, certainly not with sort of current international climate. Check to add anything to that, Lee? Um, you're muted if you... Um, I, the, on the political question, um, uh, I mean, this, this relates back to the, the age-old question of um, where do we start with socialism? Uh, 
Um, yes, I think it's inevitable that any uh, smaller economy will would face uh, significant challenges. Uh, but then that's true with social democracy already. Um, uh, the minute that you elect any left wing, I mean, Greece during the um, the Eurozone crisis suffered uh, enormously because of its the size of its uh, economy uh, with respect uh, in comparison to the weight of um, uh, German and, fin and French financial institutions. Um, but even France, uh, under Francois Mitterrand, you know, he was elected on a, a broadly socialist or uh, left, certainly very left wing platform a coalition between the Parti Socialist and the, uh, and, the, and the Communists. And within months of his election, he had to uh, backtrack from that and to such an extent that he became known as the Thatcher of France. Um, we do have to take very seriously the question of, um, of where, uh, where we're going to begin doing all of this. Um, we have no, increasingly we have no choice but uh, to be mounting our, our, um, our challenge on a global level. Um, of course, that's a big ask. Um, hmm. <laughs> but in terms of uh, political strategy, that's, that's a much broader question than, um, than I think what we're talking about in terms of just the feasibility of economic planning at this point. But yeah, I would agree. I would absolutely agree that what we would be looking for would be something in one of the larger economies uh, to get things going first. All right. So Hans asked, I much enjoyed the People's Republic of Walmart, and it's great to learn about Philip Dabrich's work today. What I'm wondering about is values. It seems to me all you offer is more efficient ways of distribution and planning, but not any way of addressing, let alone changing values. So for instance, in Philip's example, opportunity costs are advantage over cockshots labor costs, and it's great to take emission costs into account. But the change of values, example given whether em emissions matter or are external, is fundamentally outside the planning model, right? So I suppose it's addressed to Philip. Um, I'm not entirely sure if I understand the question right. Uh, so the question was sort of if the emissions are outside of the planning model. Um, and so in uh, uh, the way that I imagine that is that there has to be some kind of political, of course, sort of scientifically informed decision on these environmental constraints, right? So there would have to be uh, a, a decision. I mean, I mean, this can't be based purely in economics because this is ultimately also like a, a climate science question. How much CO2 can we emit right and there would then have to be a decision on this which ideally would be made democratically um, on uh, how strictly we're going to limit emissions and that's that doesn't come out of my my model that's basically a, a political decision right and that's imposed on the model then introduced as a constraint and my model then has to deal with it and find the optimized production plan which doesn't uh go beyond this limit. Of course, um, you know, you might, you might think, well, ideal would be from a climate science perspective if emissions tomorrow were zero, right? And uh, we not emit anything anymore. Um, so, but if, we, if you did that, you'd, uh, the economy would probably collapse and we would start starving and uh, freezing and whatnot, right? But the good thing about planning is that you plan in advance, you plan before you actually do it, right? So you can try out a couple of emission constraints and then, you know, go to people and say, well, this is, this is what the plan would be like, right? This is how many consumer products we'd have left if we emus uh, reduced emissions that drastically. And then you'd have to decide which one, which emission constraint are we going to go with. So uh, Julian writes in the chat, Thank you both presenters for the interesting presentations. What are your favorite reasons for preferring large scale economic planning to fix market failures and misallocation over a legis legislative framework on top of a market system? For example, CO2 limits. And maybe as a follow up, if there's time, how can we make sure the economic plan does not repeat the same misallocation that happens in a market system? Either of you may. I mean, maybe I could go first on this one, Phil. Sure. So 
uh, social democracy is already a form of planning. It, uh, it, it is an interventionist approach, uh, making um, allocation decisions uh, politically rather than leaving it to, to, to market mechanisms. So um, to some extent, we're just we're talking about to what extent are we uh, planning? So I guess this would be the distinction between economic planning and a planned economy. Um, and fundamentally, if we are, um, I, I think the, the challenge that we are, we're faced with is if it were simply a matter of, um, as you know, social Democrats argued within the sort of post-war period that um, we could just constantly ratchet up the, the scale of planning and the regulation and slowly take over more and more of the economy. I mean, I, I mean, I am very sympathetic to that perspective. I really am. But we have to recognize that if it were as simple as that, um, uh, we have no explanation as to why um, by the late 1960s, early 1970s, the post-war uh, welfare state consensus began to break down. Um, there were locuses of, of, so long as you, if you have a, social democratically regulated market economy, you still have locuses of power that emerge as a, a result of the growth in wealth. That those locuses of power then intervene or supervene over uh, the, uh, the democratically elected social democracy. So at some point you do have to um, euthanize, um, euthanize um, private power. It isn't enough just uh, to have continued social democracy. I would say that I mean, the, we see this today. There are a great number of social democrats making very strong arguments about how we need to return to the post-war model. But then the easiest um, response that you, we might have to them is, OK, if it were as simple as that, why did it ever break down in the 1970s? Why did we get neoliberalism? Yeah, I agree with that. So, I mean, there's, there's the case that in many ways uh, sort of universal economic planning as i call it um, is more efficient right because markets do fail and uh, you have sort of a lack of transfer of information between competing enterprises because they you know have have different interests and and you have all these these problems which i think in sort of most more universal production planning of the entire economy uh, could be fixed but the other problem uh, is simply sort of the, the power imbalance and also sort of economic imbalance, which results sort of, you know, in plain old Marxist terms from the private ownership of the means of production. And uh, that's something that's going to continue uh, if, you, if you have, uh, as long as you have private ownership of the means of production, is that uh, those owning the means of production, the capitalists, are going to have more political power, they're going to have more economic power, and they're going to um, going to basically get paid for owning the means of production, right? And uh, I think that's just not a sensible way of, of distributing, uh, distributing resources, distributing income. Uh, so ultimately, um, while, you know, I think there are important steps you can take in this direction, even now with climate change, we certainly have to, we can't wait, you know, for uh, for compute complete socialization of everything before we start planning, you know, how to transform uh, towards like a more um, low emission energy system. Um, but uh, ultimately, I think that's the only way that you can have uh, a reasonably egalitarian society is if if the means of production are owned in common in some way. If I can just add one more thing there. Um, I just wanted this is this this also poses a challenge to uh, models of market socialism, and um, I'm sympathetic to market socialism as a, a step on the way to uh, to a more planned economy. Um, I mean, realistically, day two after a democratically elected socialist gov government, uh, they're not going to be able to plan absolutely everything immediately. So you will have to move through some stages and. Uh, certainly, um, uh, worker co-ops are preferable to privately owned uh, firms, but just as the, uh, the, the the private firms that begin to be more and more successful um, begin to be a locus of power through their increased wealth, uh, enabling them to supervene over 
uh, the, uh, the democratically uh, the, the dem democratic decision making within capitalist society or in a social democratic uh, a social democratic government equally within a market socialist society the uh, the workers co-ops that were the most successful would equally begin to uh, have great outsized amounts of wealth and therefore power within that society and would once again be able to supervene over uh, society, de democracy as a whole. Um, I think Paul Koshot has done some interesting work modeling this, showing that in the long run, a market uh, socialist economy, uh, the distribution of wealth, uh, or put another way, the rate of inequality, uh, approaches that of a, of, a, of a purely market society for exactly the same reasons. And this comes back to the very core of our critique of, um, of, of capitalism is the commodity form. Uh, there's, a, there's a reason why uh, Marx put uh, the commodity as the very first subject um, in his, 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 his work, uh, Capital. Um, this is what drives all of the other irrationalities in society. Um, it's not this added extra that we can just leave hanging around once we solve the problem of getting rid of bosses in a worker's co-op. Um, so I'll take a question from Mira in the chat, and then I will address the questions posed by Mitchell earlier, which were mostly addressed to uh, Philip and uh, asking very specific questions on his model. Uh, so uh, I postponed it a little bit. Um, so first, Mira's question. You mentioned the example of the too big to fail companies as an example for the fact that the mentioned bankruptcy problem. Wouldn't this still be a problem of a planned economy because this would be one huge company instead of some very big ones, but also a lot of smaller ones. The risk somehow still seems bigger when it is a single state venture, especially as the connection to the well-being of the people seems more closely connected. I believe, just like you said, the problem exists in both capitalism and planned economy, but the consequence of a state bankruptcy seems more dire than that of example given one airline failing. The danger of it becoming huge and inefficient seems big. So either of you could answer. Yeah, I would. I would say I. Don't, I don't agree. I think that the um, uh, in a, a socialist society, uh, the uh, the fallout from um, loss of job from the loss of jobs in a failing enterprise is simply that you are real you 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 are reallocated to a different firm. Um, you don't need to keep that enterprise going in the same way that um, uh, or for the same reasons. That in a, um, a, a private a private uh, market economy, uh, those companies need to be constantly bailed out uh, because they're too big to fail. Um, I, yeah. Yeah, I'd also say I mean bankruptcy is not really something that that makes sense in uh, in the context of a socialist economy. I mean bankruptcy means like you know a private company running running out of money basically. Um, but even in, even in capitalist uh, economies, the state issues the money, right? They can't run out. They can't, the state can't go bankrupt. They, they issue the money. So, um, and in a socialist economy, uh, you might not even have money in that, in, in that sense. You might have uh, these like credits or labor vouchers or whatever, but they are also just issued by the state. What you can, of course, have is that you have, uh, a certain factory right and at some point the plan determines this factory is like uh, not needed anymore we better could better use the resources like for example the steel that's being uh, processed in that factory we could better use that somewhere else and then that factory maybe has to shut down but as lee says um, that uh, it's not going to be a problem for the people working there because um, they would I believe in an income guarantee or a job guarantee, which is that uh, uh, that that people would be would not would not be left out on the streets just because you know the production plan or the algorithm has now determined that this factory isn't needed anymore. They'd be uh, used; uh, so their, their labor would still be used somewhere else, or maybe in until you know some other use for them is found. Uh, they might also uh, 
not have to do anything, but still, uh, still, you know, be able to afford uh, their rent and uh, and food and whatever they need. You know, they shouldn't be left out on the street because of that. And there's no reason that they have to, unless we run out of houses for some unrelated reason. All right. So Mitchell has a couple of questions. Um, first of all, he uh, would like you to notice that he has contributed to a book called Democratic Economic Planning by Robin Harnell, which came out last week. It's linked to in the chat. Um, so the first question is to both of you. Are you familiar with Walmart Labs? This is the computer development arm for Walmart. And they have a GitHub repository, which can be accessed via the link in the chat. Oh, here. wow. No, I, I didn't. Um, I should say that I do need to get going soon. So, no problem. It was great having you. Go as you, as you. Okay, do. all right. And that book looks really interesting. I'll check it out. Um, I guess I just uh, I'll just say one last thing before before I go. Um, um, all of this work is incredibly uh, important. Well done, all of you guys at ADH. Um, but we really, really need to be thinking about the very long term. Um, this is a multi-generational, perhaps even multi-century long project of transformation away from uh, the irrational um, um, system of, of markets. And we, as well as thinking about the fee purely pure feasibility of, of planning, we now also need to be thinking about the political strategy about how we um, we, we develop that. And that, I don't know if I have all sorts of answers for that. That's something we have to come up with um, collectively, internationally, over the coming years and decades. All right, thanks a lot, guys. Great having you. Thank you yeah, so much. Great. And okay. just quickly, we also do deal with these political questions. So if you want to check out our website uh, or if you want to talk to us uh, on the future about this topic, that would be great. See you. Um, okay, so. Are we going to take a few more questions? Or? Yeah, so Mitchell has a lot of questions that are addressed specifically to you. So I think mm -hmm. now is a great time to, uh, to work these through. Um, he says, in the book we published, we included a category for intermediate goods. Example given steel. Why are intermediate goods excluded in your work? We were able to include it in our model and in our software code. Yeah, they're, they're not excluded. Um, so iron was an example of an intermediate product in, in the table that I gave. Uh, so like this kind of product that, that might not be used by uh, consumers, but is used in industry. And uh, corn was another intermediate product, which might also be directly purchased by end consumers, but it's also used for baking bread, right? So um, yeah, no, so, so that's very much uh, taken into, uh, into account and uh, it's not at all something that I'm ignoring. So next question, is your code available online and in source control in GitHub, Bitbucket, et cetera? It would be good to review the source code and repeat the experiments. Uh, not yet. So I'm, uh, there's a paper of mine which is currently undergoing peer review. Um, and hopefully, uh, so first of all, in that paper, when, once that's published, it, there will be sort of a, uh, explanation of how the model works, which I think is um, sufficiently detailed that anyone could reproduce it based on that. And then I um, hope to also release the actual source code, but I want to sort of um, uh, polish it a bit before I do that, because I think at the moment no one would understand it except me. So uh, it's just something I haven't gotten to yet, but once once I've had the time to do that, I'll, uh, I'll want to release that as well, yeah. Okay. Okay. The next question is, how does your model include feedback from the consumption side for collective consumption? Right. So collective consumption, I assume, means, you know, like public services or something like that. That's, that's what I assume. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Um, so there's, I, I, I currently don't really intend this to be something uh, where there's, a feedback in the same way as with like these sort of individual consumer so consumer goods. I think this can on the one hand be like a more um, political decision, right? Uh, of course, based on, you know, scientific and other evidence and so on, right? But um, for example, you know, what, what train lines uh, 
we're going to build. Of course, you're going to take into account like, you know, how many people want to travel along a certain route, right? You're going to take that into account. But uh, I don't think this has to be uh, the same kind of mechanism, which is sort of mimics the market price mechanism in some ways, right? I think this uh, is sort of falls under these sort of long-term strategic planning decisions. Um, there's uh, another way that it can be done, which I've proposed in, in the past, or we as ADH, I think, have also proposed, uh, which is you could, um, if, if you think of this as being something that's like tax finance, right? Of course, usually uh, public spending is like decided through some kind of political institution. Um, but you could also imagine that maybe a certain portion of tax funding uh, could be allocated by people individually. Uh, so um, let's let's take like a, a town and you have like people who want uh, public resources to go towards building a new swimming pool, but other people, they prefer having more uh, football fields or whatever uh, because they don't like swimming. They prefer playing football uh, or soccer for Americans. Um, and uh, you, you could then, you know, give give each person sort of a certain amount of, of credits which they can put towards public projects like this uh, so that you don't, you know, just have a situation where maybe like 51% prefer the swimming pool and then all resources get put into swimming pools uh, and even though 49% people prefer soccer, right? So you, you could have mechanisms like that as well, but that's, I think, a separate consideration from, from what I uh, look at in my current model. Okay, and so the final question from Mitchell. Um, you mentioned getting 30 iterations with strikes them as a lot. In, in their work, they were able to get an average of 11.85 iterations using an arbitrary price vector to a 5% threshold. With that same vector repeated, we got to 5% and just an average of 6.5 iteration. Do you shoot for a perfect match between consumer demand and workers' productive output? Um, so I think, I think you got a reasonable approximation of market clearing prices even before that. Um, I think at the, after around 20 iterations, it was like uh, quite consistently a good approximation. Uh, I, I went for 30 in the end because I thought, you know, that's roughly like one month and I thought that might be like a, a good uh, way of doing it. But it, in the end, it depends on how good the control mechanisms are. As I said, I use like quite uh, simple ones. Uh, uh, but I'm sure if someone, as I said, if someone that knows more about control engineering had a look at this, uh, they could probably come up with a controller which could approximate these things much more quickly. And also, um, I mean, you only need to adapt prices if they are out of balance in some way to begin with, right? And a lot of the time that might not be the case. So you might start off with like really good prices anyways that don't need to be adapted and then they'd be perfect from the beginning. Uh, so third is just what I went for because it fits like with one month and uh, it was clearly like enough time for the prices to adapt. But I think it could be done a lot quicker and that's what you should aim for. Okay, so we have, I think, uh, three more questions. And I think after that, we should call it a day, maybe. So General Intellect asks, how would you respond to critiques that say that a labor voucher system still retains the pressure to work? That this is collectively necessary is obvious, but for individuals to choose to work or not isn't possible in the system, or is. Is there something like a socialist version of UBI that wouldn't make working unnecessary on a specific standard on, of living? Right. So, I mean, you, you, you can do that. I mean, the, my model doesn't really specify what sort of your welfare policy has to be, right? So um, you can distribute the to the, these credits in, in any way that you want. Uh, of course, you're going to have, you know, all the issues that might be associated with this uh, in terms of like incentives to work. Are they necessary? Um, for me, it's also like a question of fairness um, because I think, you know, we should have a reasonably egalitarian distribution of like consumer goods 
uh, obviously want to avoid like gross inequality. But it's not just about distributing goods fairly, it's also about distributing bads, right? And that includes very much uh, sort of the effort that goes into uh, in, involved with labor and uh, that goes into the effort that goes into producing stuff. And I think that has to be distributed fairly as well. So um, while you can, you know, have various policies uh, that would in principle be compatible with my uh, system, I'm, uh, I, I would, you know, say that it's from, from a fairness perspective, at least it makes sense if, you know, all of us do a reasonable share of labor. And then if you, if you have things like automation, which allow us to work less, um, I think it's fairer to say that everyone can work less, uh, that we, um, that we reduce the workday for everyone instead of saying, you know, some people just don't need to work at all and others still work 40 hours a week or something, which I think is ridiculous. Okay, so two more questions. One of these is more, and the other one is less serious. So I suppose the first one is the serious one and they, it was posed by David. As long as it's not viable to nationalize and plan all sectors of the economy, how far can planning models such as Philips be already useful for a mixed economy? And how is it compatible with markets still existing in other sectors? That's a good question. I'm, I mean, the answer is, I'm, I don't know, I'm not sure. I mean, when I, when I came up with this model, I very much had a, um, had a like, end state socialist economy in mind where already everything is sort of uh, subject to the plan and probably also uh, publicly owned. And I think, I, I, and, and I know the, the same was the case for uh, Paul Cockshot and Ellen Cottrell, whose model my model is based on, because they originally wrote their book as sort of a reform package for the Soviet Union, right? So they didn't start off with like a capitalist economy and wanted to transform that to socialism. They had like the socialist uh, or the, the Soviet system and wanted to transform that to this kind of like cybernetic socialist system. Um, could this also be applied in a mixed economy? Um, I mean, I think various aspects of the model already are being applied. You do have like, uh, you know, companies like Walmart uh, or Amazon, which Lee talked about, they do adapt their prices with like algorithms, uh, which are probably much more sophisticated with, than what I'm using in my simulation, right? But uh, so, so you already have these elements. Um, linear optimization uh, has long been used uh, in capitalist enterprises. Uh, I mean, this is not at all something that, that I've invented or that is new and uh, that is commonly used uh, within enterprises. And uh, I mean, as Lee, as Lee says already, like Walmart is also extending that throughout their supply chain, right? And also, uh, so this also already incorporates more than just one enterprise. So yeah, there are ways of at least implementing elements of it. Whether sort of my model as a whole uh, would be able to do that, I'm not entirely sure. Okay, great. So for the final question of today, this is a great old question, but have you considered human nature? Have you, Philip? Uh, I have. Uh, but I came to the conclusion that it's not really relevant and we should uh, not make, not really have to like, we, we shouldn't make too many assumptions about, you know, what, what humans are like and what they might be like in a different system, right? I think we should develop a system which works if humans are evil bastards uh, and which also works if they, they are not right, and I think my uh, my model is able to do that because it doesn't make any assumptions about human nature at all, really. Okay. All right. So we got that settled. Um, <laughs> thank you so much for the talk you gave today, and um, I was very glad to see all of you uh, come to this uh, to this talk here. Uh, if you're interested in uh, joining the ADH, uh, working with the ADH in some regard, or uh, just keeping informed about what we are doing in the future, I've posted links to our social medias and uh, our website in the chat. And uh, be happy to uh, see you all again. And uh, until next time. <laughs>
Um, oh, Pierre, so Marcel, do you maybe uh, want to promote our upcoming events, like those that we have um, planned? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah. So on the tenth of of the okay these these upcoming events i'm going to talk about are all in german so if you don't speak german i'm sorry um they're not really accessible to you um on thursday the 10th of june we're going to have a talk about neoliberalism that is intended to be sort of an introduction to neoliberalism uh, that's going to give people who don't yet understand what neoliberalism actually means sort of an overview both historically and like theoretically uh, what it is exactly why we oppose it and uh, where we can actually see it, which is going to be on the 10th of June at uh, 19, uh, uh, 19 o'clock uh, UTC plus two German time. And the next one I think is going to be on the 25th of June. It's just going to be a discussion on the modern monetary theory with uh, Philip Dabrich and Fabian Lea. Um, which is going to be on, on on Zoom, and it's also going to be on in uh, in German. So uh, same goes here. Um, check it out. I think it's going to be great. Any questions still remaining? Then uh, not not to Philip, but general questions. Then quickly post them. Other than that, I would wish everybody a nice evening or day. Um, maybe maybe one one remark with regards to the events. There is one that is like. In the in the making that is uh, for for English speaking like that also English speaking people can attend. Um, we're gonna interview and have a discussion with Rodrigo Nunes about his newly published book, neither vertical nor horizontal, uh, theory of political organization. Um, so the organization of that is in in the is in the making. We don't have a date yet. We will promote once everything is set. But like, hey, that's also really fucking cool. And that will be in English. Great. So uh, look out for that. We're going to inform you on our channels. See you all soon. Bye-bye.